Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I've been joined here on the set by the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Thank you. Your majority in the general election fell from 4,796 to 346. Theresa May says she'll fight the next election as leader of the Conservatives. Is that the right decision for you? Absolutely. I mean, what? it was a disappointingly small majority from my point of view. There's a lot to do over the next few years. I'm going to make sure that as part of a government that's delivering on Brexit and making sure we uh, deliver on the reforms that have been proposed this week, or such as on housing, such as on health, that we can really win back some of those voters that I lost in Hastings and Rye. You've worked closely with Theresa May for over a year. After losing the Conservative majority, we know Theresa May, by her own admission, said she shed a tear. Her world essentially was shattered overnight. How difficult has it been for her to pick herself up? Well, I think it was difficult for all of us. It came as a surprise on the night, and I think it's taken us a while to recover from that. But I think that what we see now is Theresa May uh, very committed to making sure that we do deliver on our commitments for reform, on our commitments for ambitious change in this country. And what we're going to hear from the speech today is some of the items that will help deliver that, particularly, as you said, on housing. So I think it's fair to say we all felt a wobble after that outcome, but now we feel much more together, much more united, much more clear about the fact that we've got nearly five years to try and deliver on these changes we want to make. Even though what you're offering is being seen as a paler imitation of what Labour has to offer, well, and all the things you talked about were in the manifesto ahead of that election well, 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 in which you lost your the majority. The big difference between us and Labour on some of these things is A, we're in government, we can do this, and we do have a working majority so we can deliver on it, and B, we can show how we're going to do this. I mean, Labour's proposals are generally uncosted and take no account at all of what families actually need in terms of paying for things, in terms of the deficit. So I think theirs is kind of fantasy land, ours is realistic, but it's also ambitious. They, of course, did have costings, uh, which you didn't have uh, when it came to manifesto time before the election. But all this talk of Theresa May that we're going to hear a bit more about in her speech of patriotic duty to stay on, doesn't it smack a little bit of desperation that she's having to dig so deep? The conference has felt flat. You know, I've felt it, others have felt it. Tired and out of ideas, big ideas to answer I, I the just, big questions. Her leadership is not going anywhere. I, I, listen, I don't agree with you on the ideas. If you actually listen to some of the proposals from the Secretaries of State, I like to say that in my speech I made some interesting new ideas, new policies. So did Sajid Javid, so did Jeremy Hunt. There have been ideas out there. I do accept that it started off flat. You know, we needed a bit of time to recover our mojo. But what I see at the end of, uh, you know, four or five days here in Manchester is people much more committed to making sure that we can deliver on what we're trying to do. We are the party in government. And also, we should take the fight to Labour. We shouldn't be passive about this. There's a lot of talk about my seat, and I intend to make sure that I really fight it well. I campaign and deliver for Hastings and Rye. But I think we should also start looking at Labour's marginal seats. Let's think about how we're going to win in 2022 as well. Right. And you said that you found your mojo. What was the game changer in the conference that turned it from being flat to something more energetic well, in your view? Well, I think there was a lot going on in the fringe. I mean, people reported that they'd never seen fringes so busy. And actually, there were a lot of ideas coming out there. And I think that, that was, you know, the, the hall wasn't as packed as it usually is. No. That's absolutely true. But on the fringes, there were some of them were literally standing room only. There were ideas coming out there. There were, you know, new MPs making very interesting proposals. And also fringes where Boris Johnson perhaps um, was speaking. Those will have been packed. There, there I mean, is always that hazard. It is a hazard, is it? <laughs> there is always that hazard, as I say. You've accused Boris Johnson of backseat driving on Brexit. Now, he's backseat driving this entire conference, isn't he? How frustrating is it for you personally to have him around? Listen, I think he's an important part of the team. Uh, he's the Foreign Secretary. He does a great job. He does attract a lot of attention. And I think sometimes I would rather our policies cut through because we've got a lot of good policies to do, to show to people, to propose. And I think that sometimes it gets in that way. And I do find that frustrating. But mostly, I think he's an important part of the team. And not a liability? Uh, I think he's an important part of the team. No, not a liability. Right, let's listen to what he had to say last night at a fringe event on Libya. There's a group of uh, UK business people actually, I don't know whether you have come across them, some uh, wonderful guys who they, they, they literally have got a brilliant vision to turn CERT into the next, uh, with, the, with the work, with the help of the municipality of CERT, to turn it into the next Dubai. The only thing they've got to do is clear the dead bodies uh, from that. <laughs> 
Is that acceptable language for the Foreign Secretary to well, use? Well, he has now clarified those comments and put out a, a set statement setting out what his view is and what could be done in the area. What does and he I say? think that, well, I urge you to show it to your readers. I can't recall it off the top of my head, but as far as I'm concerned, he set out what he meant by that, and I'm content with that. Right. He said that Certe could become the next Dubai once it cleared the dead bodies away. Was that a massive misjudgment on his behalf? But, but could you perhaps also re read out what he said subsequently in terms of setting out the context of why he said that? What's the context? I mean, I haven't actually seen, but what is the, what, what context could there be for trying to compare Certe to the next Dubai once they've cleared the bodies away? Well, I agree with you that that phrase was ill-judged, completely. But there is a wider point he's made here about the commitment that we have as a country to helping in Libya, to making sure that we help it regenerate, and we will do that. Right. Does he need to come out and actually say something and apologise? No, but he has. He's made some comments. I haven't got them with me, but he's made some comments on Twitter setting out why he on thinks... Twitter. Should he come out and say, that was a mistake, I retract those comments, I apologise? I would rather take the opportunity for the government, for him, for me, to get on and talk about the things that we're doing rather than get drawn into a vortex of talking about what the Foreign Secretary meant at you know, a fringe he went to. Right. It's important for many people, including some in your own party. Sarah Wollaston, the Tory MP, has said he should consider his position. Heidi Allen said he should resign. Labour are also calling for him to resign. Should he actually stand up and apologise? I think that the Foreign Secretary has clarified his mistakes and I'm, ca I'm content with that. What do you think it does to Britain's position in the world, that sort of behaviour? I think that he's a foreign secretary who people expect to go out to, uh, you know, to, to engage with diplomats, to engage with other countries, and he does it in his own particular style. He's, he's, you know, he's sometimes effusive and he's sometimes more difficult to get to uh, you know, tow the party line in areas, but generally he's a very good foreign secretary and we should let him get on with that. How much further are you going to let him go? I mean, how much rope should he be given to say it's these it's sorts of things that have offended people? That's, that's, that's really not for me to comment on. So should Theresa May uh, the, 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 take... the, Listen, the Prime Minister's in charge. It's going to be entirely up to her. All right. Well, Boris Johnson's been accused of being on manoeuvres this week, leadership ambitions, and he's not the only one to be accused of that. Have you yourself hired Linton Crosby, the Tory election strategist, to run your election campaign? No, I haven't. Uh, I have been talking to various people about working out what else I should focus on in my campaign in Hastings and Rye because I want to make sure that I deliver the right sort of campaigns, the right sort of changes in my constituency so that I can improve on the vote in 2022. Do you think there's an election round the corner then? I do not. But like most MPs, I start campaigning the day mm. after a general election, not the day before. And as you say, you have got a very small majority. Yes. Um, what does that do to your ambitions, like most other cabinet members, to become the next leader of the Conservative Party? You no, know, my ambition is to be a really good Home Secretary, like the last one. But I also have to make sure, but I, as everybody does, whatever their majority, that they look after their constituency, they stand up for their rights, and I will make sure that I do. Let's talk about housing because that has been billed as the big announcement today. And Damien Green, effectively the Deputy Prime Minister, has talked about a rebirth of council housing, of social housing. How many houses do we need to talk about for it to be a rebirth? Well, the Prime Minister is going to set out in her speech, which is coming just in a few minutes' time, uh, how many we think will be built by the commitment that we're making today. But So I'm afraid we're going to have to wait and see from her what those numbers will look like. Do you think it should be bigger than 6,800? Because that was the number of additional council homes that were completed in 2015-16 for England only, and that's a huge drop-off from recent years. Should it be higher than that? I think you'll find it's more ambitious than that. Right. But in terms of trying to address the issue of the supply side on housing, we have also set up other proposals this week in terms of help to buy and also some changes to make it tougher for landlords on the private rented sector. So housing has been a theme this week and this builds on that. Right, if it's been a theme this week and you want people to trust the Conservative government to build those homes, why in the 2015 manifesto when you promised to build 200,000 starter homes by 2020, not one's been built yet? I don't think that's quite true. No, it is. Well, the DCLG figures. OK, well, they are, they are, the, the market has turned. They, they are starting to be built. Last year was the, start, the largest starter 
year, for a number of years, and we do have until 2020. We're serious about making that target. Right, but you're behind already. I mean, you can see that you can make endless promises about housing, and this government and other governments have done the same, but the, but the figures just don't back it up. Well, today you'll hear how we're going to deliver on exactly that, deliver on those figures, and make sure that we do address the very difficult situation with housing. Let's talk about your department um, in the Home Office. You've been Home Secretary under an unprecedented scale of terrorist activity on Britain's shores. You've identified WhatsApp and other messaging services as a big problem. What specific action do you want them to take? I want them to invest more of their time, more of their expertise, more of their effort in making sure that their platforms aren't used as a safe space for terrorists, for abusers, for paedophiles, for general criminality. We'll continue in just a moment because we are just showing our viewers pictures there of Theresa May with her husband Philip. They've just left the hotel and they're making the short walk here to the conference in Manchester and in about 20 minutes time the Prime Minister will be making her conference speech. There are all the snappers and photographers waiting to capture the two of them going in. Let's go back to WhatsApp. Um, you've said you want them to invest. What do you want them to do about end-to-end -end encryption? I want them to work with us so that we can have, so that the security services and the police, where it's properly warranted, where it's properly covered by our legislation, can have some access to the material that's being exchanged by criminals. But you can't have access to the material. Only the sender and the recipient have access to the messages on WhatsApp when there is end-to-end -end encryption. Well, that's correct, but there's other information. Who's in the address book? Where were you when you made these calls? There's other information that is available that helps track people down, that they could engage with us more, and if they did, it would make our security services be able to do their job better. Do you accept, though, that you'd either have to stop end-to-end -end encryption or accept that it will continue until you have the phone in your hand and can access those messages? I accept that there is no plan to ban end-to-end -end encryption. I know that when I talk about this, people always come out and say that. I am not. I think encryption is incredibly important for our banking, for our digital economy. Right. But what I don't accept is that they should continue not to engage with government. They need to engage with government so we can have access to other elements around that that will help our security services. And this is what the IP bill calls for, which was heavily debated in the House of Lords and the House of Commons last year. It's not something outside legislation. It's trying to make sure that the area in which the security services work to keep us safe doesn't go ever smaller and darker. Right. I mean, you've admitted you don't fully understand the technology terrorists and other criminals are using. A lot of people don't. But do you think that will be reassuring to the public when that is, as you say, a very important part of your brief. Listen, you can regulate the, uh, you know, the aeroplane market without understanding how the engine inside is put together. I can regulate and improve and work with the internet companies and the security services without understanding the mathematics between the end-to-end -end encryptors. Another very important part of your brief is immigration and that net migration target. Was it a mistake to reinstate tens of thousands? I'm very comfortable with the target. What we have to do is continue to reduce it but to protect businesses. What I haven't done is put a date on it. What's important is that it continues to come down. In the past year, it's come down by just over 80,000. You, so you won't put a date on it, so it could be years? No, but I, think, I think when you're working in government, it's very important to have a target so you know which direction you've got to drive policy. But I'm not going to put a date on it, but I am saying we're going to continue to reduce it. But I want to do it in a way that protects businesses, protects universities, and does, it that protect, does protect the economy. Do you think there is a threat to businesses by reducing it too fast? I, 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 do, I think it would be a mistake to reduce it too fast and I have a lot of lobbyists coming, no, not, not, not lobbyists, a lot of businesses, business organisations coming to see me to say we need people for this, we need people for that, so I'm determined to do it in a way that doesn't do it too fast and allows them to skill up people locally. What do you say to George Osborne, the former Chancellor, none of its senior members of the Cabinet as it exists now supports the pledge to reduce net migration to tens of thousands in private and all would be glad to see the back of something that has caused the Conservative Party such public grief. Is he right? No, no, as I've said, I'm perfectly comfortable with being able to reduce net migration and we're going to continue to do so. Andy Street, just briefly before I let you go, um, the West Midlands Tory mayor said actually for him as a former businessman and speaking to businesses in his region, says net migration should be around 150,000 or up to. Is he right? I hadn't seen him put a target on it. but He did hear yesterday. OK. But I mean, I think the most important thing is that we get the balance right of reducing it but making sure that there isn't a labour shortage. That we give enough support to businesses and we continue to invest in local skills. Amber Rudd, thank, thank you very you. much. Well, joining me now to take the mood of conference today are Anoush Chakalian of The New Statesman and the Conservative commentator Ian Dale, who has a show on LBC. Welcome to both of you. I was just speaking to Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary. 
She said, or she agreed, that the conference was a bit flat. Uh, maybe a massive understatement, but that the party had got its mojo back. Has it? I think they haven't had a bad conference. I mean, they have actually talked about why the election result didn't go as they would have wished it to, which is frankly more than Labour did last week in, in Brighton. Um, this is a great cavernous hall here um, that where, where the cabinet ministers make their speeches. It's very difficult to get a good atmosphere. Um, I think the fringe has been quite lively, but I think she's right. The conference itself, a bit muted. But it has all been about Boris Johnson, hasn't it? It has. He's sort of dominated, and the idea that he has leadership ambitions was always going to haunt this conference after he um, scuppered Theresa May's Brexit speech a few weeks ago. Um, and now he's got himself into more trouble with his Libya comments. And all of these Conservative MPs, as well as the Labour Party, are calling for him to resign. Now, this just highlights Theresa May's weakness even more because she can't sack any of her ministers. And isn't that the point? It's more about Theresa May than it is about the antics of Boris Johnson. Should he go? No. Um, I think he... If he was going to go, he probably should have gone before now. I thought what he did with that Telegraph article was a disgrace because it was quite clearly a challenge to her, even though he said it wasn't uh, meant to be a leadership challenge. It was basically saying, look at me, I'm still here. And I think Anish is right, a lot of Conservative MPs are fed up with this self-indulgent behaviour, not just from Boris Johnson, but one or two other Cabinet Ministers too. And it's got to stop because y you and I remember lots of Conservative leaders in the past who've had these issues yeah. with their either Ministers or Shadow Ministers. And people don't vote for divided parties and, and they ought to know that by now, they ought to learn from history. So why shouldn't she sack? Boris Johnson, then wouldn't that help? I, I don't agree with Anish that she's not powerful enough to, enough to sack anybody now. I think she's come through the summer. I, I think her Florence speech slightly set her back a few paces because it didn't really say anything new. Um, but I think she's got through this conference so far. Um, I think, well, she's very good at these set piece speeches, these big events, and she very rarely fails in those. Them. Exactly. And um, I think the party is going to want to hear some sort of explanation as to what happened in the election. But actually, I think they want to look to the future. But you haven't answered the question really about whether he's now gone so far, having dictated red lines, having talked about Brexit, gone beyond his brief on things like public sector pay, and now made this crass remark, to put it lightly, about a, you know, a city in Libya being the next Dubai once they've cleared the bodies away. Well, I think he, he should be sacked, but she doesn't... I, I disagree well, with it, and I think... You think he should be anyway. Yeah, so. I think he should be anyway, but I do think that um, she doesn't have the power to. However, if she did sack him, he'd cause just as much trouble as he is in the Cabinet anyway, so maybe, maybe well, she'd well, get he, away with it. he might, but I don't know if Tory MPs are saying the same things to you as they are to me, but certainly all the Tory MPs I've spoken to here think that Boris's chances of becoming leader have virtually evaporated. Now, I think he sort of the speech yesterday was a good one, but they have lost trust in him. I think some, some website put out a poll this, this morning showing he's only got the support of 30 MPs, so he's not in the powerful position that maybe he once was. Well, and certainly the... Uh, uh, senior Tory politicians I've spoken to are deeply irritated uh, about what they see as a distraction from issues like housing. There's going to be a big push on housing, clearly. They're going to try and set out some vision, Theresa May will try and promise a, a sort of a new generation of house building. Will it work? Well, I think this is telling that this is going to be her big announcement. And we already had the idea of the tuition fee repayment easing at the beginning of the week. Both of these policies are what attracted younger voters to Jeremy Corbyn in the election. So now, to add to Theresa May's woes, we have MPs accusing her of Corbyn light, chasing Labour's tail by introducing these kind of policy themes to the conference. Right. And, and in a way, they have been paler imitations of what Labour's had to offer on student finance, mm. on housing. What's the point? Well, what this conference has lacked are big ideas. But what we have to remember is that there are four and a half years until the next election. Um, I wouldn't expect a Tory party conference four years ahead of an election to come out with huge numbers of big ideas. Um, I don't know what she's going to say on housing, but you're right, the student announcement was, was is it, yeah, and? Mm. I mean, it's not, that's not going to get all those votes back. Um, I, I think we've also got to recognise that until April this year, she was seen as sort of master of all she surveyed. She was high in the opinion polls, the Tories loved her. And then overnight almost, she became this sort of weak figure, mainly due to her own efforts in the election. The same thing could happen to Jeremy Corbyn over the next four years. The election is four years away. Tories shouldn't panic, but they shouldn't do a lot of navel-gazing either. Right, just in the sort of final seconds, what do you want to hear her say? 
Um, I want to hear her actually deliver some policy on her first words at Downing Street where she said she wanted to help ordinary working people. Will we hear that? I doubt it. And deal with the burning, burning injustices that she said existed in society. Well, you haven't got very long to wait because supposedly she'll be standing up and taken to the conference stage in about five minutes' time. Welcome to viewers who join us on the BBC News Channel. I'm delighted to say I'm joined here on the set by the BBC's political editor, Laura Kunzberg, and by Theresa May's former director of communications, Katie Perrier. Welcome to both of you. Final day of the conference, Theresa May taking to the stage shortly. Is this going to be a more personal speech? Uh, a more personal speech about how she is digging deep into her reserves Absol in terms of duty and obligation? Absolutely, Joe. You know, one of the things that people have continually said since she moved into number 10 is what does she really believe? What's she really about? She's not been the kind of politician who sort of would burst onto the stage and do a huge kind of confessional. And, you know, 12 months on, after the Tory trauma of the election result, people are still asking that question, what is she really about? questioning now to you what is the party really about and today she is going to try to answer some of that you know her answer to what do you believe in is always something like I believe in people and I believe in duty and that today will as I understand it be quite a central theme of the speech to try to sort of make that meaningful for the people here and of course they hope for the country right Katie Perry I mean you know her you worked with her what is she like then what is her vision well, first of all, Theresa May is quite warmer behind the scenes as she is on the stage and when the cameras start rolling. So I'm hoping that people see a little bit more of her personality in today's speech than they've normally seen before. I think she needs to kind of blow the doors off, to be honest. I think she needs to come out today and she needs to be strong and bold. It's not always about what she says. It's actually the body language and what she, how she holds herself today. And I think that would be key. Now, the body language that you mentioned it is usually quite <coughs> sort of straight, um, maybe a little austere. Does mm. she need to warm up a little bit? Well, I think we'll see. I mean, it'll be interesting. She doesn't like talking about herself. She doesn't oh. like doing the personal. You know, some politicians very much use their own story, their own personal experiences all the time. It's their way of communicating and they hope sort of empathising with the public. She's not comfortable doing that. So this party at the moment, it seems to me, wants to sort of be taken by the scruff of the neck. They want to be led. They want her to come out and, you know, sort of blow the doors off. But for her, that will be quite a thing to do because it's not necessarily it's not her modus operandi and we've seen it on a few occasions we saw it the day she moved into downing street and frankly almost every time we've seen a minister appear this week they've been well the speech in downing street on the steps of downing street mm. to, you know that speech was probably her one of her best political moments ever and she, i think she, people here want her to refine some of that spirit really yes and the spirit of that mm. and those phrases you know the burning injustices that she wanted to try and do something about the just about managing does she now have to come out with some answers for those questions that she posed well, absolutely because if you look at her conference speech last year mm. when she talked about that how much has truly been, del been delivered in one year since that speech you've had distractions on brexit distractions of a, of a failed general election campaign so she now needs to come back and refocus on that the idea of a mass council house building policy is a great one and i really hope we're going to see that fleshed out today not just on numbers but on timing we need to build those quickly right and we will talk about that no doubt after the speech because there will presumably be some more detail about that mm. one of the problems well, for her hope. though is yes we hope <laughs> it doesn't um, it's not always the way we no the but some numbers would be great um, uh, particularly since the record is not very good mm. um, one of the problems for her, though, is being continually upstaged by her foreign secretary. Absolutely, and overnight we've seen again, mm. you know, a gaffe of quite enormous proportions on a very sensitive subject with what most people here would agree is very inappropriate language, talking about dead bodies in Libya in rather a sort of glib way. And again, you had, you know, this sort of moving story as it was, that was sort of sucking up attention and oxygen from what the Prime Minister wanted the agenda to be this morning, is yet again the Foreign Secretary trampling through in his size tens, mm. trampling all over what she's trying to do. Now, we've just seen him uh, taking a seat next to Amber Rudd. Of course, there are other people also around the Cabinet table who are very interested in their own futures. And that is, of course, bubbling under the surface of this conference. It's not just Boris. There are other people who want to think that they've got skin in the game for what happens next. And that is an undercurrent that, you know, if you're the leader of a party and you know that lots of your colleagues want your job, 
It's a great place to be. Yes, well, we asked um, Amber Rudd mm. just a few <laughs> moments ago about whether she has hired yeah. the Tory election strategist Linton Crosby to run her next campaign. She said not, but she is talking about how to improve her performance next time round. So, mm. I mean, Laura's right, it's happening already, isn't it? Well, it is, but of course, Amber Rudd spent this morning going around doing programmes like yours, having to defend Boris Johnson. There's nothing quite more annoying than that, and I think well, you can see it all over her face oh, this yeah. morning. Well, yesterday she was asked on camera, oh, are you looking forward to the Foreign Secretary's speech? And she said on camera, what about the Home Secretary? Mm. You know, that irritation among his colleagues is visible, it's tangible. People are putting it on the record. On the record, senior MPs are calling for him to be moved. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've I'd... got a real sense of the irritation mm. from other uh, cabinet members yeah. about the attention being drawn away from them. Um, and in terms of Theresa May, has he gone too far now with these comments on Libya? I think that he will probably have to apologise for those comments because I do think that people have kind of had enough of it. I used to work for Boris Johnson when he was Mayor of London in a campaign running up to him. If I was his spin doctor, as they like to call it, I'd be furious and I would be pushing him to resign. To not resign, I'd be pushing him to apologise. Yes, because he said something on Twitter but not actually a, a, an apology in so, so many words. Now, I think we... Um can see Kemi Badenoch, who is the new MP for She's Saffron uh, Walden, Excellent. and she is actually going to be introducing um, Theresa May and bringing her onto the stage. There she is, over the slogan, building a country that works for everyone. I, I was just, I, I need to go and take my seat in just a second and dash into the hall, but I was just going to say one thing. The point about Boris Johnson is not necessarily that he has been upsetting and making his colleagues cross and embarrassing the Prime Minister. The point is that in a week where the leadership has not been very forthcoming with big things to say and big arguments to make. It has meant the sort of an empty space. So a big character who's making mistakes and making people cross fills that space. But that to me is sort of, is a metaphor for really what has been happening here this week. The party members scratching their heads and MPs scratching their heads saying, what do we do now? What are we about? Where should we be going as a party? Where is the prime minister going to take us? So he's filled the space because the leadership has left the space. And that's what always happens in a vacuum. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think that the poor, mediocre offer that we arrived at this conference with, actually, conference is being planned at number 10 weeks in advance. You have a conference grid. And I thought it was a pretty poor offer. And of course, it left that space for Boris to fill. There's nothing more irritating than having to go around talking about Boris Johnson all week if you're Theresa May or you're Amber Rudd. And I think that she's going to try and put that right today. She needs to be, look like she's in bold and she's in charge. Laura, I think we can let you go and it you is. go and take your seat inside the hall. Um, it should be in a few minutes time when Theresa May actually takes to the stage and we will hear more about the offer that she is going to make on big issues. Do you think they should have planned more for the Prime Minister to do this week so that there wasn't this gap to allow the Foreign Secretary to step into? Yes, and when I was at number 10, I used to say to people that why is the grid not stronger? Why don't we have stronger stories across government? Why aren't we selling our vision and our story? And I was told by ministers across government that actually it's because David Cameron used to own that grid more. He used to do more things. He'd want to be somewhere on a Monday, somewhere on a Thursday to top and tell the week. And Theresa May didn't want to do that and do as many, as many things. So actually, I feel that they've let her down in some way by not having a strong enough grid to land the conference on the Sunday morning and to carry us through to today, the main speech. So there's been a lack of energy, um, a lack of energy around the Prime Minister herself, maybe because she perhaps can't manage that sort of timetable and that sort of grid. I disagree in many respects because she has got the more energy than any politician I've ever worked for in terms of absolute long commitment. She's up really early in the morning, she's working until late at night. We went to one trip in India, we did 17 events in one day. You know, she is hardcore, she's not someone that, that would hang back and think, I'll only do a few things. It's about vision, it's about political will, it's about the ideas and we have been, we've, we've lost the ideas, we've lost the vision and we need to bring that back. Do you think she could learn something from Boris Johnson's more ebullient approach? I mean, the fact that he is able to rouse the Tory party faithful here in the way he did yesterday, even if it wasn't vintage Boris Johnson, as some of the commentators said, that actually she should perhaps take on some of that infectious behaviour. The thing is, she's really risk adverse and the biggest risk she ever took in her career went wrong and so maybe it sent her back even more. But I feel, what have you got to lose? If you're only going to be Prime Minister for the next couple of years to take us through the Brexit negotiations and then probably move on, then why not be bold? Why not be a bit more Boris-like? Show some character, show some personality and show that you have a vision to take this party forward because we need someone to stand up for what it means to be a Conservative, what it means to support capitalism. Against the Ca Corbyn, you can't out Corbyn Corbyn. So let's not try. Let's Let's be different, but let's uh, show that we've got something about us today. Do you think the conference has looked as if they're running scared?
scared of Labour and Labour's agenda, particularly Philip Hammond's speech where he focused so much on the 1970s and a brand of socialism that has failed? A little bit. I think also feel that actually they can't believe we're in this situation that we're in. I mean, 20, 24 points ahead in the polls in the general election and then it all went quite quickly downhill. So I think that there is a bit of that, but also we are scratching around looking for our own vision and we've had to regroup. I mean, it was an amazing address to a business dinner the other night that I was present at where he said, you know, if you're going to collude with these people, you're just as bad, you've got to stand up. So a very impressive kind of, but slightly startling speech to, to business faithful. Does everything hang, though, on the success of Brexit? Does Theresa May rise and fall on delivering the sort of Brexit that can be deemed a success? I would love it not to be the case. I would love it to be the case that the Conservative Party would be judged on its domestic policies, helping the just about managing, the burning injustice of people across the country. The truth is, everything is seen through the prism of Brexit now, whether we like it or not. So she has that battle on her hands. And uh, you know, it's whether or not she can squeak through that space. You only have to open the newspapers. There's not much room for anything else other than Brexit stories. Who's winning in that battle, do you think, um, at the top of the Tory party and the Cabinet in the type of Brexit that this government will deliver? Well, oddly, I think that they have come to some kind of kind of, kind of loose agreement. And the Florence speech was about that. And it was very clever of her to do that before she came to party conference, because otherwise party conference would have been dominated once again by Brexit. It's a clever move. So I think that they've probably moved into that centre position together. The, the feedback we're hearing internally is that the European, it landed quite well with the Europeans and they are much closer now to doing a deal. And so it's about the finer points rather than these massive gaps that were there beforehand. Now we asked people here about how long they think Theresa May can go on, whether she will still be leader and fight the next election. What say you? Theresa May can't fight the next election, in my opinion, for the Conservative Party, because we sh we've seen that she's no real campaigner. She's like the best CEO of a FTSE 100 company, but she's not a campaigner. And we need someone fresh and new. And I think once we've got ourselves over those Brexit negotiations, we need to kind of park this current lot in a way and see if we can look further to fresher faces within the Conservative Party. We kind of need a renewal at that point. Right, so you think at around sort of March 2019, as early as that? I think Christmas 2019. I think that she'd see through that that transition over to the point when we are no longer in the European Union and then do a proper handover. I can see us being at party conference in 2019 and, and taking to the stage our new party leader. Right, well, Kemi Badenoch is uh, still there up on the stage, warming up the audience and all the conference goers that are gathered inside. And there was a queue actually snaking around this conference hall for the first time, as you would expect, I suppose, for the Prime Minister to um, take to the stage for her speech, probably one of the most important of her life. Indeed, and there is so much pressure on her. And she does have to take some credit and some respect from us that on a day where you'd rather stay under the duvet and act like it's all... <laughs> we all feel like that. You know, let it all go away. She's actually you know, got, got, got to get up on that stage and got to suck it to us. The expectations are high and mm. I do feel for her. But I think in time we will look a little bit more fondly on Theresa May than we, ha we do now because she does deserve that respect from us. She is a great public servant. She is the vicar's daughter that will see this through for as long as we want her and I do respect her for that. Do you think that's overplayed though, this sense of duty? this sense of obligation, that she is not a person that drinks in the bars, that doesn't play the games around Westminster. I mean, do you think that is, to some extent, playing up her weaknesses rather than her strengths? But it's not overplayed, and the thing is, you can't be someone you're not. And what people don't like is that, that politicians are not authentic. I mean, the queue and the applause mm. for Rhys Mogg this week, which slightly frightened me, being a modern Conservative, looking towards the future, was because they like him because he's authentic. And Theresa May shouldn't try and be something she's not. She should say that, you know, these are my limitations. The problem is at the moment is that she doesn't really address her weaknesses. She doesn't say, look, you know, I'm not the kind of person that's going to sit here and give this emotional interview. I don't play on that. I play on how to fix problems. That's why I'm in this line of work. That's why I do. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in politics. And so I don't think it's overplayed, actually. Do you think they are willing her to succeed there in the hall? Absolutely. I haven't met an activist, a business leader this week who thinks there's any other choice right now than Theresa May as leader of the Conservative Party. We are really willing her to, to succeed today. We're backing her all the way. And we, we know that she's not perfect. We know that this year has, has highlighted some major flaws, but she needs to have us on side this week. Uh, there was talk a couple of weeks ago that we might be you know, slow clapping her. We won't be doing that. There'll be rousing support in the hall today.
Right, well, I think they are doing an introductory uh, video just before Theresa May actually goes up onto the stage. And typically, of course, she's late, isn't she? I suppose that is the prerogative of a prime minister and any party leader. Um, she was probably due to take to the stage between 11.20 and 11.30. Well, it's coming up to quarter to 12. Um, she's scheduled to speak probably for just under an hour. Do you think that's about right? Jeremy Corbyn, um, I said, was a bit long last week because it was an hour and a quarter. Oh, I hate long speeches. If it, in my <laughs> way, giving them or writing them? <laughs> both. Um, I would go for about 40, 45 minutes. That's what I would basically you know, aim for. And there's no need to rattle on for an hour or over an hour. I think that sometimes it's too long. Jeremy Corbyn started singing Happy Birthday to Diane Abbott last week. It was a cringeworthy moment. Where I sat there watching thinking, is this man really going to be a future Prime Minister for Great Britain and Northern Ireland? So I think that, don't read anything into the fact that it might be shorter, it might be longer. It's about the content, but most importantly, it's about the body language. OK, well, you say it's about the body language. When she makes this announcement, which we are expecting, on house building, how big does it have to be in order for it to grab our attention? It's not just about the numbers, although they are important. It's about the speed of delivery and the method of delivery as well. I want the Conservative Party to be innovative. I want them to be thinking about all different types of tenure and housing. I want them to be thinking about modular build. You know, let's put houses up quickly that will last and look beautiful. We should move forward now. We should presume in favour of development in some places of the country and we should look, talk about beauty and what they might look like. People are nimbies because they're stuck with ugly stuff in their backyard. We need to put beauty in their backyard. We need to turn people, a whole nation of bimbies instead of nimbies. Right, well, that's your vision. I can hear it there. Do you think it was a mistake to dump some of the bits of the manifesto um, that were, you know, that was her manifesto? That's what you must have worked on um, since the election? Yes, I mean, actually, if some of those things that were in the manifesto were pitch rolled, that's what we call in the business when we say, you know, talking to charities, talking to businesses in advance, so that when you go and deliver that, you have third party people coming out in support of what you're doing. If that had done properly, then I think that some of that stuff would have landed much better. So the manifesto in itself now is continually being just being outrageous. There was actually some really good stuff in it. Right. And do you think some of that should come back? I mean, in the end, if everybody is pitching towards what Labour are offering, people want a decent wage, uh, a secure home and some sort of comfort in old age, aren't those the basics that the Tories should be providing? Well, they are. That's it. These are all inherently Conservative policies. And I like the way that people are saying this week about how you know, matching Labour policies. Well, there's not much between us in terms of what we want for people. As we go on this year, we're going to have a budget on November the 22nd, I think it is, and then we're going to go on to, to the winter. There will be an NHS winter crisis. There always is. I was in number 10 last year when I had to suffer this day in, day out, looking at the, you know, the newspapers. And I think the conversation will come back then about how do we deal with people in old age in dignity, because we haven't got a solution. We've had a general election. It's all got a bit messy, but we still don't have a solution for that. And in that vision, should taxes go up? Quite possibly. Right. All right. I think we'll leave it there. I can hear. Oh, the hall is now standing. There is Philip May and Gavin Barwell, her chief of staff. And here is Theresa May, the prime minister, ready to make her big conference speech. A little over 40 years ago, in a small village in Oxfordshire, I signed up to be a member of the Conservative Party. I did it because it was the party that had the ideas to build a better Britain. It understood the hard work and discipline necessary to see them through. And it had at its heart a simple promise that spoke to me, my values and my aspirations, that each new generation in our country should be able to build a better future, that each generation should live the British dream. And that dream is what I believe in. But what the general election earlier this year showed is that 40 years later, for too many people in our country, 
that dream feels distant. Our party's ability to deliver it is in question. And the British dream that has inspired generations of Britons feels increasingly out of reach. Now, I called that election. And I know that all of you in this hall, your friends and your families, worked day and night to secure the right result. Because of your hard work, we got 2.3 million more votes and achieved our highest vote share in 34 years. That simply... <laughs> that simply would not have been possible without the long days and late nights, the phone calls, the leaflet drops, the weekends and evenings spent knocking on doors. So for everything that you do, let me say thank you. But we did not get the victory we wanted because our national campaign fell short. It was too scripted, too presidential, and it allowed the Labour Party to paint us as the voice of continuity when the public wanted to hear a message of change. I hold my hands up for that. I take responsibility, I led the campaign, and I am sorry. But the choice before us now is clear. Do we give up, spend our time looking back, or do we do our duty, look to the future and give the country the government it needs? This country will judge us harshly if we get this decision wrong. Because all that should ever drive us is the duty we have to Britain and the historic mission of this party, this Conservative Party, to renew the British dream in each new generation. That dream that says each generation should do better than the one before it. Each era should be better than the last. The dream that for decades has inspired people from around the world to come to Britain, to make their home in Britain, to build their lives in Britain. The dream that means the son of a bus driver from Pakistan serves in a Conservative cabinet, alongside the son of a single mother from a council estate in southwest London. And in a way, that dream is my story too. Now, I know that people think I'm not very emotional. <laughs> I'm not the kind of person who wears their heart on their sleeve, and I don't mind being called things like the Ice Maiden. <laughs> now, perhaps George Osborne did take the analogy a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something. My grandmother was a domestic servant who worked as a lady's maid below stairs. She worked hard and made sacrifices because she believed in a better future for her family. And that servant, that lady's maid, among her grandchildren, boasts three professors and a prime minister. Oh. And, and that's why the British dream inspires me, why that dream of progress between the generations spurs me on. And it's why today at this conference, this Conservative Party, must pledge to renew the British dream in this country once again. To renew that dream is my purpose in politics, my reason for being, being, the thing that drives me on. And it's never wavered through good times and hard times. My belief that this Conservative government can renew it has always remained strong. For whenever we are tested as a nation, this party steps up to the plate Seven years ago, our challenge was to repair the damage of Labour's Great Recession, and we did it. 
The deficit is down. Spending is under control. Our economy is growing again. But we didn't limit ourselves to that ambition. We have achieved so much more. An income tax cut for over 30 million people. Four million taken out of paying it at all. Employment up to a record high. Unemployment down to an historic low. Income inequality at its lowest for 30 years. More women in work than ever before. Over 11,000 more doctors in our NHS. Over 11,000 more nurses on our hospital wards. Free childcare for three and four year olds doubled. 1.8 million more children in good or outstanding schools. Three million more apprenticeships. Crime down by more than a third. More young people from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university than at any time in the history of our country. Britain leading the world in tackling climate change, eradicating global poverty and countering terrorism wherever it rears its head. Same-sex marriage on the statute book so that two people who love each other can get married no matter what their gender. And a national living wage, giving a pay rise to the lowest earners, introduced not by the Labour Party, but by us, the Conservative Party. <clears throat> so let us never allow the left to pretend they have a monopoly on compassion. Yeah. This This is, this is the good a Conservative government can do, and we should never let anyone forget it. But it's easy, when you've been in government for a while, to fall into the trap of defending your record and standing for the status quo. Yes, we're proud of the progress we have made, but the world doesn't stand still. Change, as Disraeli taught us, is constant and inevitable, and we must bend it to our will. That means staking out an agenda for Britain and uniting behind it too. And the agenda that I laid out on day one as Prime Minister still holds. It burns inside me just the same. Because at its core, it's about sweeping away injustice, the barriers that mean for some the British dream is increasingly out of reach. About saying what matters is not where you are, from or who your parents are, the colour of your skin, whether you're a man or a woman, rich or poor, from the inner city or an affluent suburb. How far you go in life should depend on you and your hard work. <clears throat> That's why I've always taken on vested interests when they're working against the interests of the people. Called out those who abuse their positions of power and given a voice to those who have been ignored or silenced for too long. And when people ask me why I put myself through it, the long hours, the pressure, the criticism, the insults that inevitably go with this job, I tell them this. I do it to root out injustice and to give everyone in our country a voice. And that's why when I reflect on my time in politics, the things that made me, make me proud are not the positions I've held, the world leaders I've met, the great global gatherings I've attended, but knowing that I made a difference, that I helped those who couldn't be heard. Like... like the families of the 96 men, women and children who tragically lost their lives at Hillsborough. For years, they saw people in authority closing ranks and acting against them. But now they are on the way to see injustice served. That's what I'm in this for. Like the victims and survivors of child sexual abuse, ignored for years by people in positions of power, now on the long road to the truth. That's what I'm in this for. Like Alexander Paul, 
a young man who came to this conference three years ago to tell his story. The story of a young black boy growing up in modern Britain, who with, without causing any trouble, without doing anything wrong, found himself being stopped and searched by people in authority time and time and time again. Alexander spoke so eloquently about this experience and how he came to mistrust those in positions of power as a result. So, inspired by his example, we took action. We shook up the system, and the number of black people being stopped and searched has fallen by over two-thirds. I'm... I'm sad to have to tell you that last year, Alexander, who inspired us all with his passion, was diagnosed with brain cancer. And in June of this year, he tragically passed away. He was just 21. Let us today remember the courage he showed in coming to our conference to speak out against injustice, take pride that we gave him a platform, and inspired by his example, redouble our efforts to give a voice to the voiceless at every opportunity. <laughs> That's what I'm in this for. And that same commitment is the reason why one of my first acts as Prime Minister was to establish the groundbreaking racial disparity audit, investigating how a person's race affects their treatment by public services so that we can take action and respond. We already know, for example, that members of black and minority ethnic communities have a higher risk of illnesses such as high blood pressure that may lead to the need for an organ transplant. But our ability to help people who need transplants is limited by the number of organ donors that come forward. And that's why last year, 500 people died because a suitable organ was not available. And there are 6,500 on the transplant list today. So to address this challenge that affects all communities in our country, we will change that system shifting the balance of presumption in favour of organ donation, working on behalf of the most vulnerable. <clears throat> That's what I'm in this for. And it's why after seeing the unimaginable tragedy unfold at Grenfell Tower, I was determined that we should get to the truth because Grenfell should never have happened and should never be allowed to happen again. So we must learn the lessons, understanding not just what went wrong, but why the voice of the people of Grenfell had been ignored over so many years. That's what the public inquiry will do. And where any individual or organisation is found to have acted negligently, justice must be done. That's what I'm in this for. And because in, in this, as in other disasters before it, bereaved and grieving families do not get the support they need, we will introduce an independent public advocate for major disasters, an advocate to act on behalf of bereaved families, to support them at public inquests and inquiries, the strong independent voice that victims need. That's what I'm in this for. It's why tackling the injustice and stigma associated with mental health is a particular priority for me. So we are building on our record of giving mental and physical health parity in law by investing more in mental health than ever before. But there is widespread concern that the existing mental health legislation, passed more than three decades ago, is leading to shortfalls in services and is open to misuse. Detention rates under the Mental Health Act are too high and it is people from black and minority ethnic populations who are affected the most. 
So today I can announce that I have asked Professor Sir Simon Wesley to undertake an independent review of the Mental Health Act so that we can tackle the long-standing injustices of discrimination in our mental health system once and for all. That's what I'm in this for. <clears throat> this is the conservatism I believe in. A conservatism of fairness and justice and opportunity for all. A conservatism that keeps the British dream alive for a new generation. That's what I'm in this for, and that's what we must all be in this for. And we must come together to fight for this mainstream conservative agenda, to win the battle of ideas in a new generation all over again. For those ideas are being tested, and at stake are the very things we value. Our precious union of nations, four nations that are stronger as one, threatened by those with their narrow nationalist agendas that seek to drive us apart. The strength of our society, in which we understand the obligations and responsibilities we have to one another, under attack from militant forces who preach animosity and hate. The free market economy, for so long the basis of our prosperity and security. An idea that has lifted millions around the world out of poverty, called into question by those who would imperil our future by adopting the failed experiments of the past. That idea of free and open markets operating under the right rules and regulations is precious to us. It's the means by which we generate our prosperity as a nation and improve the living standards of all our people. It has helped to cement Britain's influence as a force for good in the world. It has underpinned the rules-based international system that helped rebuild post-war Europe and the world beyond. It has ushered in the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of communism and the dark days of the Iron Curtain, securing the advance of freedom across Europe and across the world. It has inspired 70 years of prosperity, raising living standards for hundreds of millions of people right across the globe. So don't try and tell me that free markets are no longer fit for purpose, that somehow they're holding people back. Don't try and tell me that the innovations they've encouraged, the advances they've brought, the mobile phone, the internet, pioneering medical treatments, the ability to travel freely across the world are worth nothing. The free market and the values of freedom, equality, rights, responsibilities, and the rule of law that lie at its heart remains the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. Yeah. <clears throat> So let us win this argument for a new generation and defend free and open markets with all our might. Because there has rarely been a time when the choice of futures for Britain is so stark, the difference between the parties so clear. And it's the Conservative Party that has a vision of an open, global, self-confident Britain while our opponents flirt with a foreign policy of neutrality and prepare for a run on the ground. Some people say we've spent too much time talking about Jeremy Corbyn's past. You may not have heard me say that. So some people say we've spent too much time talking about Jeremy Corbyn's past.
as if the protesters... A protester is now Shall being we, led uh... out of the hall. A protester that actually managed to get to Theresa May and hand over what looked like a P45. Obviously, that has completely interrupted Theresa May's conference speech here in Manchester. And actually, he was led out by security guards and also to jeers from the audience there. Theresa May hasn't said anything yet so far about it. She does need to reference this what be, happened. This could be her saving moment now. I'm telling you. I was, a, I was about to talk about somebody I'd like to give a P45 to, and that's Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. <clears throat> and we don't need to talk about Corbyn's past, we can talk about his present. Because this is a politician who wants to pile taxes on business just when we need them the most to invest in our country. Yeah. This is a politician who wants to borrow hundreds of billions of pounds to nationalise industries without the slightest idea of how much it will cost or how he will ever pay it back. This is a politician who wants to strip us of our nuclear deterrent without being honest with the voters about his plans. This is a politician who lets anti-Semitism, misogyny and hatred run free while he doesn't do a thing to stop it. <clears throat> this is a politician who thinks we should take the economics of Venezuela as our role model. <laughs> no, Jeremy Corbyn. By contrast, by contrast, when I look around the cabinet table, I have confidence that we have a team full of talent, drive and compassion. A team that is determined that this party, this great Conservative Party, will tackle the challenges of the future together. A team that is determined we will always do our duty by our country. And our first and most important duty is to get Brexit right. The people have decided we have taken their instruction. Britain is leaving the European Union in March 2019. <laughs> uh, I know some find the negotiations frustrating. But if we approach them in the right spirit, in a spirit of cooperation and friendship, with our sights set firmly on the future, I'm confident we will find a deal that works for Britain and Europe too. And let's be clear about the agreement we seek. It's the agreement I set out earlier this year at Lancaster House, and again in my speech in Florence ten days ago. It's a new deep and special partnership between a strong, successful European Union and a sovereign United Kingdom. A partnership that allows us to continue to trade and cooperate with each other because we see shared challenges and opportunities ahead. But a partnership that ensures the United Kingdom is a sovereign nation once again. A country in which the British people are firmly in control. I believe... <clears throat> I believe it is profoundly in all our interests for the negotiations to succeed. But I know that some are worried whether we are prepared in the event that they do not. It is our responsibility as a government to prepare for every eventuality. And let me reassure everyone in this hall that is exactly what we are doing. So a deep and special partnership is our ambition and our offer. And I look forward to that offer receiving a positive response. Yep.
And let me say one more thing, because it cannot be said often enough. If you are a citizen of the EU who has made their life in this country, I know you will feel unsettled and nervous. But let me be clear that we value the contribution you make to the life of our country. You are welcome here. And I urge... <coughs> And I urge the negotiating teams to reach agreement on this quickly, because we want you to stay. <coughs> but whatever the outcome of our negotiations, Britain's long-term future is bright. The British dream is still within reach. For as we look to that future, we do so with the fundamentals of our country strong. Ten years after Northern Rock, <coughs> our economy is back on track. The deficit is back to pre-crisis levels. <laughs> Sounds as if my voice isn't on track. <coughs> <coughs> We're firmly on course to get our national debt falling and business investment is growing. Now, the work to get there hasn't been easy. It's meant big decisions and huge sacrifices. I know that the public sector has had to carry a heavy burden. The private sector has played its part too. <clears throat> but with government, businesses and the <coughs> public sector working together, we have bounced back. We've created record numbers of jobs So, why, <coughs> why we will never, <coughs> excuse me, we will never hesitate to act where businesses aren't operating as they should. Let this party celebrate the wealth creators, the risk takers, the innovators and entrepreneurs. <coughs> I am... Um... <laughs> I, I hope you notice that, ladies and gentlemen, the Chancellor giving something away free. But it's right that you respond like that when I talk about the risk takers and the innovators and the entrepreneurs, because it's businesses big and small who generate jobs and prosperity for our country and make British business the envy of the world. Because we understand that it's the wealth creators whose taxes fuel our public services. It's their success that funds the things we want to do. And the difference between us and Labour is that we understand that to deliver the things we want, private enterprise is crucial. You can't get something for nothing. <coughs> the Chancellor will probably tell me there'll be a price to pay in a minute. For... <coughs> but prosperity is key. And when politicians offer the earth but have no means of delivering their promises, disillusionment with politics only grows. So over the years ahead, this government 
will adopt a balanced approach to the economy, dealing with our debts, <coughs> keeping taxes low, but investing in our priorities too. Things, things like our vital public services, our schools, our police, housing, and our great national achievement, the NHS. And let's not forget that it is this party that has invested in the National Health Service and upheld its founding principles through more years in government than any other. For For we understand, the NHS doesn't just bring us into the world, make us well if we fall ill, nurse and care for our families through their final hours. It doesn't just bear witness to moments of joy and to times of intense sorrow. It is the very essence of solidarity in our United Kingdom, an institution we value, a symbol of our commitment to each other, between young and old, those who have and those who do not, the healthy and the sick. And like most people in this hall, it's been there for me when I've needed it. I have early childhood memories of visiting my family GP. More recently, it was the NHS that diagnosed my type 1 diabetes and taught me how to manage it so I could get on with my life. And in recent months, I have seen it at its most brilliant. In the world-class response shown by the doctors, nurses and paramedics, when terrorists struck London and Manchester. To them all, and indeed to the public servants everywhere who so often go unsung, let me say this, for your service, your hard work, and for your dedication, thank you. And because we believe in ensuring that a world-class NHS will be there for generations to come, we will increase funding per head for every year of this Parliament. We will oversee the biggest expansion in training for doctors and nurses. <coughs> and we... <coughs> <coughs> And we... <coughs> Shows what good the Chancellor's cough suite is. <laughs> <coughs> and we will always support the service to deliver safe, high-quality care for all, free at the point of use. And that's... <coughs> That's what our balanced approach to the economy will help us to do. So with our economic foundations strong and economic confidence restored, the time has come to focus on Britain's next big economic challenge, to foster growth that works for everyone right across our country. <coughs> that means keeping taxes low, <coughs> spreading prosperity to all corners of this UK, and getting out into the world to trade, export, and help our economy grow. So as the world's leading advocate for free markets and free trade, we will pursue new free trade agreements with countries around the world. And as we roll out... <laughs> as we roll out our modern industrial strategy, we will attract and invest in new high-paid, high-skilled jobs, spreading prosperity and opportunity 
to every part of this country. Tackling our economy's weaknesses like low levels of productivity, backing our nation's strengths, and bringing investment, jobs, and opportunities to communities that feel they have been forgotten for far too long. We will continue to reform education and skills training so that people growing up in Britain today are ready and able to seize the opportunities ahead. Starting in our schools, those great drivers of social mobility, where our record is strong and our legacy is proud. Because our reforms are working. And after years of stagnation under the last Labour government, we are turning things around. But But there is more to do, and our reform programme goes on. Because it's simply not good enough that if you live here in the north, you have less chance of attending a good school than someone living in the south. So we will extend the free schools programme for a new generation of young people, building 100 new free schools in every year of this parliament. Not because our ideology says so, but because free schools work and it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and we need to bring that same energy to skills training too. Preparing our young people for the world of the future. Setting them up to succeed. Taking skills seriously with new T levels for post-16 education a new generation of technology institutes in every major city in England, providing the skills local employers need, and more technical training for 16 to 19 year olds. A first class technical education system for the first time in the history of Britain. keeping the British dream alive. And that's how we will prepare Britain for an open global future. I know that some young people worry that Brexit means we're turning our back on the world, that Britain will no longer be open but closed. But we reject both the isolationism of the hard left and those who would have us turn inward. And we choose a global Britain instead. As Asia booms and the world looks to the east, we will reach beyond the borders of Europe to become a trusted friend to nations all around the world. We will meet our commitments to international security with the finest armed forces and intelligence services anywhere on the planet. We will build an outward-looking Britain that cooperates with other nations to tackle the great challenges of our time, like mass migration, modern slavery, and climate change. And, <clears throat> and we will provide a moral lead in the world and set an example for others, meeting our commitments on security, committing fully to the NATO alliance, and spending 2% of our GDP on defence. <laughs> remaining, <laughs> remaining firmly committed to renewing our independent nuclear deterrent to help uphold the security of the world. And leading the world in cracking down on modern slavery. Because if you are buying and selling another human being, you are undermining all that is right, the very basis of our humanity, and we must bring this outrage to an end. <clears throat> and under this government, we will continue to meet the international aid target <clears throat> spending 0.7% of our GNI on international development. That's not, that's not just because it's good for Britain, but because it is the right thing to do. Today, 
<clears throat> Today, UK aid is being used to bring food to starving children in conflict zones in Syria and Iraq. UK aid is being used to bring water to drought-stricken parts of Africa. UK aid is helping to educate women and girls in parts of Asia where that most basic of human rights has been denied to them for so long. Yes, charity may begin at home, but our compassion is not limited to those who carry the same passport. We should be proud. <clears throat> we should be proud that under a Conservative government, this country is one of the few that is meeting its duty to some of the poorest in the world. And as Prime Minister, I will ensure that's something Britain always continues to do. But let me also be clear. It is absurd that international organisations say we can't use the money to help all those that have been hit by the recent hurricanes in the British Overseas Territories. <clears throat> Many people on those islands have been left with nothing. And if we must change the rules on international aid in order to recognise the particular needs of these communities when disaster strikes, then that's what we will do. So, this then is the Britain that we choose. Not a Britain that ret retreats behind its borders, but a global Britain that stands tall in the world, a beacon of hope, and an example to others. A modern, compassionate Britain that we can all be proud to call home. And we must renew the British dream at home through a determined programme of economic and social reform. A programme that champions our belief in free markets by being prepared to reform them when they don't work. That ensures our economy and society work for everyone in every part of this country not just the privileged few. Because for too many, the British dream feels increasingly out of reach. The effects of the financial crisis, nearly a decade of low growth, stagnating wages and pay restraint linger. The boom in the housing market means that while some have done very well, for many, the chance of getting onto the housing ladder has become a distant dream. And it's that fact perhaps more than any other, that means for too many, the British dream is increasingly out of reach. Just over a decade ago, 59% of 25 to 34 year olds owned their own home. Today, it is just 38%. Now, it's always been a great sadness for me and Philip that we were never blessed with children. It seems some things in life are just never meant to be. But I believe in the dream that life should be better for the next generation as much as any mother, any father, any grandparent. The only difference is that I have the privileged position of being able to do more than most to bring that dream to life. So I will dedicate my premiership to fixing this problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dedicate it to restoring hope, to renewing the British dream for a new generation of people. And yes, that means fixing our broken housing market. For 30 or 40 years, we simply haven't built enough homes. As a result, prices have risen so much that the average home now costs almost eight times average earnings. And that's been a disaster for young people in particular. Now, we have begun to put this right. The number of new homes being delivered each year has increased significantly since 2010. Our housing white paper set out plans to increase it further. 
ensuring councils release more land for housing and giving them new powers to ensure that developers actually build homes once they're given planning permission to do so. <laughs> and because it will take time for greater house building to translate into more affordable house prices, we've introduced schemes like Help to Buy to support people who are struggling right now. But the election result showed us that this is not nearly enough. We've listened and we've learned. So this week, the Chancellor announced that we will help over 130,000 more families with the deposit they need to buy their own home by investing a further £10 billion in help to buy. We've announced measures to give the increasing number of families who rent from a private landlord more security and effective redress if their landlord is not maintaining their property. And today, I can announce that we will invest an additional £2 billion in affordable housing, taking the government's total affordable housing budget to almost £9 billion. We will... <laughs> We will encourage councils as well as housing associations to bid for this money and provide certainty over future rent levels. And in those parts of the country where the need is greatest, allow homes to be built for social rent well below market level. Getting government back into the business of building houses, a new generation of council houses to help fix our broken housing market. So whether you're trying to buy your own home renting privately and looking for more security, or have been waiting for years on a council list, help is on the way. It won't be quick or easy, but as Prime Minister, I'm going to make it my mission to solve this problem, and I'll take personal charge of the government's response and make the British dream a reality by reigniting home ownership in Britain once again. <laughs> And, um, and let, me, let me say one more thing. I want to send the clearest possible message to our house builders. We, the government, will make sure the land is available. We'll make sure our young people have the skills you need. In return, you must do your duty to Britain and build the homes our country needs. And, and to renew the British dream for a new generation of young people, we must also take action on student debt. As Conservatives, we know education can be the key to unlocking the future. That's why, for more than a century, it's been Conservative education secretaries who've driven the reforms that have widened access and raised standards. And it's why we want everyone to have the opportunity to benefit from studying more after they leave school, because it's good for them and good for the country too. But today, young people take on a huge amount of debt to do so. And if we're honest, some don't know what they get from it in return. So we have listened and we have learned. So we will undertake a major review of university funding and student financing. We will scrap the increase in fees that was due next year and freeze the maximum rate while the review takes place. And we will increase the amount graduates can earn before they start repaying their fees to £25,000, putting money back into the pockets of graduates with high levels of debt. For while we are <laughs> while we are in favour of free markets, we will always take action to fix them when they're broken. We will always take on monopolies and vested interests when they are holding people back. And one of the greatest examples in Britain today is the broken energy market. Because the energy market punishes loyalty with higher prices. And the most loyal customers, the most loyal customers are often those with lower incomes, the elderly, people with lower qualifications, and people who rent their homes. Those who, for whatever reason, are unable to find the time to shop around. That's why next week, this government will publish a draft bill to put a price cap on energy bills, meeting our manifesto promise and bring an, an end to rip off energy prices once and for all. <laughs> so
So, we have a big task before us, an agenda to follow, a duty to uphold, to renew the British dream for a new generation and bring our country together again. For a country that's divided can never make the most of its potential. And we need to harness the potential if we're to compete and succeed in the years ahead. That's why where others seek to bring division, we must stand united, recognising, as Joe Cox put it, that we have more in common than what divides us. It's why... <laughs> it's why I will always be proud to call myself a unionist and proud to be the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party too. because that word means something special to me. It stands for this great union of nations that has so much to offer the world. And it stands for this great union of people, people from all over the world who've made their homes here and are proud to call themselves British, attracted by the strength of the British dream. We are an example to the world of how people of different colours and creeds can live side by side, and we celebrate that. And as a proud unionist, I take comfort that the general election saw the threat of nationalism set back. The case for a second referendum in Scotland denied. Yeah. <clears throat> and wasn't it a br brilliant result for the Scottish Conservatives and their superb leader, Ruth Davidson? Yeah. Together, quite simply, we are stronger. So we must unite the country around our conservative vision of a global, prosperous Britain in which the British dream is alive. That means showing that we're determined to make a difference, to doing something, not being someone, to doing our duty by Britain again. Because people are fed up with the game playing, the name calling, the refusal to listen to the other's point of view, we can look around the world and see where this approach to politics gets us. Anger, recrimination and polarisation too. So we must, all of us, look inside. Consider how we conduct our politics in this country and find a better way. For there's a big problem in our politics when an MP from one party refuses to be friends with those of another. There is... <coughs> There's a big problem in our politics when a leading journalist from our national broadcaster has to hire bodyguards just to be able to do her job. <clears throat> there is a problem when one of our two great political parties is so riven with the stain of anti-Semitism that even one of its own council leaders question if they will be welcome in his city again. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. Racism, intolerance and hatred has no place in British politics or British society. This party will never permit it. We will always stamp it out. Yeah. Britain can do better than this, for this country is and always has been the home of tolerance, a bastion of freedom and a beacon of democracy. And this city of Manchester knows it better than anyone. Because four months ago, this city came under attack from those who hate our country and despise our values. The liberty we extend to everyone, whoever they are and wherever they are from, the way in which our society is open, accepting and tolerant of others. The fact that we celebrate diversity and champion difference. 
the way we encourage people from all backgrounds and beliefs to live their lives in freedom, to be all they want to be. And because of this hatred, they chose to take out their rage on the defenceless and vulnerable, the innocent and the young. Let us be in no doubt. The responsibility for such an outrage lies with no one other than those who planned it and those who saw it through. And this party, which knows the terrible toll of terrorism all too well, will never seek to justify or excuse such acts of terror. <clears throat> we, will, we will stand strong in the face of terrorism and ensure our values always prevail. But what we remember most from the cowardly attack <clears throat> on the Manchester Arena is the response of the spirit of Manchester. Yeah. <coughs> okay. No, <coughs> we remember. <coughs> We, rem we remember that spirit. People throwing open their doors to strangers, giving them a place to shelter. <coughs> Taxi drivers, helping people get home safely, <coughs> accepting no fare in return. Ordinary people, rushing to the scene of destruction, putting themselves in harm's way. <coughs> The incredible men and women of the emergency services, running towards the carnage, while others dropped what they were doing and went back to work to help. But above all, an image of a community coming together. Men and women, young and old, black and white, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Hindu, Jew, standing together as one. And it was that image of this city an image of modern Britain in all its diversity, compassion and strength that was shared around the globe. And it said something about us. It said that this is modern Britain, a country of promise, of potential, of hope. And perhaps we too easily forget that. But we must hold on to that essential truth. For we are a nation of dreamers with the capacity to deliver those dreams too. Cities like Manchester were the pioneers that fired the Industrial Revolution, helping to make Britain the workshop of the world. And it's this heritage that means today we export to and trade with nations in every corner of the globe. It was here in Britain that we discovered the structure of DNA, the biological code for life, all the technologies for sequencing the human genome have been developed in this country, and today we're using the knowledge to improve human health. Back in the 1970s, it was scientists in Oxford who invented the lithium-ion battery, which powers all laptops and mobile phones. And today we continue to be pioneers in this sector, funding new battery technologies for electric cars and renewable energy technologies we will soon be exporting around the world. Within a few hundred, hundred yards of here, you will find the world's first passenger railway station. And a few hundred yards beyond that, a new research facility to develop the extraordinary material, graphene, for which two scientists here in Manchester won the Nobel Prize. And... <clears throat> And let me say this to George Osborne. You were right to back it as part of the Northern Powerhouse, and this government will back it too. So the future... <clears throat> the future is bright, our potential is great, and if we choose the right path, the British dream can be renewed. So let us do our duty by Britain. Let us shape up and give the country the government it needs. For beyond this hall, beyond the gossip pages of the newspapers and beyond the streets, corridors and meeting rooms of Westminster, 
life continues. The daily lives of working people go on. Many pay little attention to great conferences and gatherings like this. They get up early and go to work. They want to know their job is going to last and that they're going to get paid a fair wage. They want to know the school their children go to is the best it can be, that they will be cared for when they fall ill, that they will have security and safety as they advance towards old age. And they want to believe in the British dream that their children will do better than themselves, that they will have the opportunity to lead happy, successful, secure lives, that they will have the chance to be all they want to be. These are the priorities that it is our duty to respond to, the priorities of working people up and down this land, and they must be our only focus. Not worrying about our job security, but theirs. Not addressing our concerns, but the issues, the problems, the challenges that concern them. Not focusing on our future, but on the future of their grandchildren and children, doing everything we can to ensure their tomorrow will be better than our today. That's what I'm in politics for, to make a difference, to change things for the better, to hand on to the next generation a country that is stronger, fairer and more prosperous, and to renew the British dream for a new generation again. None of this will be easy. There will be obstacles and barriers along the way, but it's never been my style to hide from a challenge, to shrink from a task, to retreat in the face of difficulty, to give up and turn away. For the test of a leader is how you respond when tough times come upon you. Yeah. When faced... When faced with challenge, if you emerge stronger. When confronted with adversity, if you find the will to pull through. And it's when tested the most that we reach deep within ourselves and find that our capacity to rise to the challenge before us may well be limitless. That is the story of our party. That is the story of our country. And that is the resolve and determination we need as we turn to face the future today. So let us go forward together, confident in our values, clear in our vision, sure in our purpose, with a rich, ambitious agenda to follow, a bold, exciting mission to pursue. Let us fulfill our duty to the British people. Let us fulfill our duty to our country. Let us fulfill our duty to Britain and let us renew the British dream. Thank you. <clears throat> well, no one, no one will be more relieved than Theresa May to have got to the end of what turned out to be a gruelling speech. Her husband is rushing up onto the stage to greet her. She herself looked Slightly tearful there at the end as they embrace. Um, I should think for her it was a nightmare trying to just make it through to the end and deliver what had been billed as one of the most important speeches of her life. But it is going to be overshadowed this speech by two things. One, the fact that her voice cracked. It was barely a whisper at certain points in that speech, but she carried on. And, of course, the interruption fairly early on from a serial pranker, a comedian, Simon Brodkin, whose main character is called Lee Nelson. He came up onto the stage. There'll be questions about how he managed to do that, how he managed to get a security pass to be part of the audience, and he handed her a P45. Nobody quite knew what was going on at that time, and he was ushered out, ushered out of the conference hall behind me here on set, and actually was followed by security and cameras and treated fairly roughly as the audience in the hall shouted out, out, out. 
As it so happens, Theresa May dealt with it extremely well, but then the problems with her voice began. Aside from that, there were some important announcements in this speech. Uh, one of them about housing, which had been billed, the £2 billion that is going to go towards social housing. There wasn't exactly a time frame for it, uh, but it was matched by money um, and it was for affordable housing. We don't yet know how many homes that will pay for. There was also um, a cap on energy prices, something that was mooted by Ed Miliband and something she has announced. It was redacted actually in the speech because it was deemed market sensitive. Katie Perrier, who worked with Theresa May at number 10, in the communications uh, department there, what do you say? My heart's in my hands, really. I feel I like her more than I ever did uh, right now because actually when you come off a conference stage with such expectations so high and all of this drama, I mean, this will be known for excitement and, and two main things that happen, but you shouldn't be in a situation where you feel sorry for someone and I feel sorry, desperately sorry for Theresa May right now. She does not deserve this. And you could see on the faces of the Cabinet, actually. In fact, it looked at one stage as if the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, asked Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, to stand up and take over if she couldn't continue. Uh, they looked concerned, to say the least. They were concerned, and you could see all over their faces how glum they looked about the situation they were in, because it was, it was only halfway through, and it was still faltering all the time, and she had to get to the end. And on the way out, you could see, actually, she looked really, really, really upset. We can see the pictures here. That is the comedian, Simon Brodkin, who managed to get up onto the stage. As I say, there was a slightly delayed reaction in terms of dealing with him. Um, there will be questions, as I said earlier, about how he managed to get a pass, get to the stage. But, of course, what has since um, transpired is there has been a tweet from him which says, Hi, at Boris Johnson, I gave Theresa her P45 just like you asked. I thought she dealt with it brilliantly. She said that actually the P45 belongs to Corbyn, not me. And the whole crowd got up and supported her. Nobody in that audience thought that was a good idea. It was a prank, it was a trick, it was a, something for a cheap stunt. And we got rid of him and then I thought we'd be back on track. And then it kind of went downhill because of the voice, the faltering. Theresa May did 26 TV interviews yesterday. Her voice just failed her and let her down. And of course, then we don't focus on some of the housing policies and the energy policies that we come out with today. I'm losing my voice. In, in sympathy, I just generally feel so sorry for her. Listen, it's a nightmare that no one would want to find themselves in, of course, that your voice goes and you're a public speaker or you're on television, but in front of the conference here with all the pressure that is on her. Um, I'm going to return to these pictures now. We can see the Simon Brodkin, the comedian who handed the P45, being slightly manhandled out of the conference hall, being followed by the press. Um, everybody, no doubt, wanting to speak to him and get his version of events as to why he was there and what he was doing. As you say, of course, it just overshadowed everything that she had to say. And she started off this speech with a mea culpa. Um, in fact, it was the biggest most heartfelt apology that I have heard her make about the election and about the fact that she adopted this presidential style and it didn't work. Yes, and um, I felt we had a really personal Theresa May coming out to the audience today. She talked about her public duty. The whole, re the top line of the speech before some of these things happened was meant to be, this is what I'm in it for. This is why I care. This is the British dream and I'm going to restore your faith in the British dream through home ownership and other things that really matter to you. I thought it was a brilliant start to this speech. And also, of course, she mentioned later on that although she and Philip hadn't been unable to have children, she was going to make the property owning democracy, that was going to be her mission, and she was going to take personal charge of that. Tell us a little bit about what she's promised. She's talked about her and much more money for house building, for, for private developers and housing associations to access. It was a bit thin on detail, to be honest, about timelines, time frames, how quickly we can get bricks laid and get people into houses. More money sometimes isn't always a solution. It's about political will. But I think we took from her that she takes that really, really seriously. She also talked very personally about her grandmother being a kind of personal servant. And now her grandchildren, the grandchildren that she is one of, is a prime minister and three professors. And we saw more of Theresa May today than we've ever done. She was helped a little bit by the audience and by the Cabinet who 
kept standing up to cheer her, to give her time to try and find her voice. But what do you think everybody who we can see now, Katie, coming out of this conference hall, what are they going to be talking about? They're going to be talking about two things. They're going to talk about a prankster that we could have probably got over because it was a one-hit wonder. You know, you can move on and she dealt with it quite well, as I say. And they're going to be talking about the fact that she lost her voice and she can never regain it. And also, it's not just about losing your voice. It's about your body confidence. And she just lost it all the way through there. And on the way out, she looked very, very tearful. She cried, when, pretty much cried when she, she hugged her husband, well, probably Philip. out of relief. I mean, she said at the end of that speech, for the test of a leader is how you respond when tough times come upon you when faced with challenge if you emerge stronger how many more tough times do you think she'll be able to take she is made of strong stuff Theresa May and she is the ultimate public servant and she will feel that duty on her shoulders to take this country through into those successful Brexit negotiations and beyond but my god if she was down already and she had to build herself up to get through this speech she will be pretty rock button today and as I say I really feel for her I think the audience felt for her they wanted to get behind her they were clapping the cabinet was behind her but we will go away today talking about a prank and a, a pretty an unfortunate set of circumstances for Theresa May. And that's, of course, what the papers will be full of, won't it? It will be. You know, the, the picture tomorrow on the front pages will be Theresa May being handed over P45. Katie Perry, thank you very much. That's all from me here in Manchester at the Conservative Party's Autumn Conference. For viewers on the BBC News Channel, there will be continuing coverage and analysis of Theresa May's speech throughout the day. Thank you for joining us. I've been